who loves us and calls us to respond, Amen. Well, if you have read your Bible or been an even average church goer, you've probably heard this passage many a time this morning, even if you don't remember it. It's not the most popular Bible story, but it is the longest of the post-resurrection appearances in the gospel according to Luke. Some preachers affectionately call this passage, Breakfast on the Beach. (laughs) I want you to notice something right there at the beginning. Jesus appears to them, and it says that the disciples were startled and terrified. You might say a little dose of shock and awe this morning for the disciples. Now, on the one hand, in Luke's telling at least, for some of them, this will have been the very first time that they have laid eyes on Jesus, even as they've heard, perhaps, that others have seen him, such as those on Emmaus, which we hear on this Sunday in other years of our lectionary, and Simon, apparently. But why else would everyone be terrified? Why would fear be their response? Well, have you ever been driving along, around town perhaps, you know, just maybe along Middlefield or something where uh, I'm reminding you that the speed limit is posted at 25 miles per hour, (laughs) when out of nowhere you hear a police siren or you see lights. Now, I can't use the word that I'd normally use in that situation, but immediately in my mind I'm asking myself, right, did I just did I just run a stop sign back there? Or like, am I, you know, speeding exorbitantly or anything? And right, the implication, of course, is that that siren, those lights are coming for me. So hold on to that feeling, right, for just a moment. (laughs) Right, imagine now that you are the disciples. You've been following your master for, I don't know, several years, who, by the way, incidentally, you've seen heal, you know, many people or you know, shrivel up a fig tree and you know he's told you how this is all going to go down and when it finally does you abandon him and deny him to his death and now find yourself in the company of everyone else who also abandoned him now if that guy comes back from the dead and you hear about it and then he shows up to this group well wouldn't you be a little bit terrified or at least in awe surprised Wouldn't you think or maybe hope you'd seen a ghost? You see, Jesus' revelation does, in this way, kind of hold up a mirror for the disciples to reconcile themselves, to be accountable for the choices that they have made, their actions, their behavior. And the resurrection invites us to do the same. Now, beloved, if you are imperfect like, like me then you will know the experience of having done something that you regret or feel bad about. There are many times like these in my life, I imagine for some of you as well. Those moments or times when your temper or your impatience gets the better part of you and perhaps being so consumed with yourself, your Christian charity kind of slides off a little bit and we take it out on someone else usually on someone we love. Perhaps like the disciples, you've abandoned someone in need, someone you know, someone like Jesus. And on the worst days, right, sometimes we just find ourselves at home kind of looking in that proverbial mirror, just like the disciples today, not even wanting to look at ourselves. Or maybe trying to say our nightly prayers and getting to bed and our minds just stirring, resisting the confession we know God has already seen in our heart. You know, the thing about fear and God in the Bible is that it's not actually unusual, but that the notable thing, scholars tell us, is that around 365 times in Scripture, we hear some version of God or God's angels saying, do not be afraid. So I guess in a leap year, we get one day, one day to be afraid. But, but generally speaking, right, what I think that means is do not let fear paralyze you, right? Don't allow fear to be the, you know, 
the motherboard running the operating system, right? Don't let it rule your hearts. And the best thing about the resurrected Jesus here in this story is that he follows up these words, peace be with you, with an action that would actually bring them peace. Jesus doesn't speak on high or in theory or esoterically, but instead with compassion and love in action. What would bring them peace? Well, quite honestly, it would be the things that would bring most anyone to peace, right? As I read it as a good Southerner, a big bear hug and some fried catfish. I know it says broiled fish in your translation, but it's just cooked fish. We don't actually know the way that they prepared the fish, okay? My point here is that Jesus does invite us to be accountable for our actions, but he does not leave us coward in fear or shame. Instead, speaking peace and then enacting peace wherever we may be. Remember that while some preachers might talk a whole lot about getting into heaven, God, it seems in the scriptures, is always trying to bring heaven closer to us as he taught us in his prayer on earth as it is in heaven. So we keep reading, and we get to the teaching portion of this post-resurrection experience. Note note here that it is only after Jesus has met them where they are, met them in their fear, offered them peace, hugged it out with them, and ate together, that he does begin to teach them, and yes, commission them as witnesses. And beloved, I happen to think this community is also modeled on that way of love and grace. In fact, I know that it is true because when you tell me in our various conversations about how you came to St. Mark's, it wasn't because you passed the true-false Bible test that we hand out on the way in the door. (laughs) Jessica, we still have those, right? We're, okay, perfect, great. Or because you received your golden ticket in the back of the Bible that you purchased, right? It's because you encountered with a loving warmth and a delicious feast here in church, at communion, or at agape. You've encountered the community of the risen Christ. It's not that there isn't much to learn. I mean, surely we could spend our whole lives having our minds opened to the scriptures. It's just that Jesus' way of love starts with fellowship and peace in the midst of whatever life has for us. Finally, then, we see, having been released from their fear, having witnessed the risen Lord themselves, and having kind of the full scoop on the resurrection, the disciples are commissioned. You yourselves are witnesses of these things. Back in March at the leadership luncheon, I introduced an organizational model for ministry with those in attendance, sort of teeing up a series of reflective conversations with leaders across the parish. These conversations flow from the work that you've been doing the past year and a half or so with your strategic planning, along with some of the vestry goals from this past year. And we held the first two of these reflective conversations this past week. And can I say, y'all, I'm just so inspired We spoke with leaders of the membership commissions and the outreach. And I just couldn't think of more hopeful conversations to be related to St. Mark's right now. Over the course of the next two to three months, uh, Debbie, Thomas, myself, and Nancy will be conducting more of these conversations with our leaders. And I can't wait to see what unfolds. But in short, the conversations from this past week kind of mapped perfectly on this resurrection appearance from Luke's gospel. As humans, right, we all live in or for those of you who don't, with of perfection. And while it's wonderful that in this country we have life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness, we all need, perhaps especially here in Silicon Valley, a freedom from the pursuit of happiness. And so membership, right, it's saying to us, in some sense, peace be with you, right? It's demonstrating and making room for that peace 
again and again here at St. Mark's. And then, of course, having been welcomed, outreach says, now now learn and grow and hear the story and live this way of love, this way of peace, and turn love into action for the sake of the world. So I can't wait to share more of what emerges from these conversations as we turn into the late summer and, and the early fall. It really is a beautiful time to be the resurrected body of Christ here at St. Mark. You know, in the last few verses of Luke that we do not read as a part of our story today, Jesus will ascend from them, and it will be on them, empowered with the Holy Spirit, to live this good news among themselves and to share it with others. And just, again, what is this good news other than what they have experienced themselves, that they have known, that they have witnessed That in their even worst moments, when they were most afraid, ashamed, or vulnerable, when they were at their wit's end, they were met and known by love and grace, when they couldn't love or forgive themselves. That there is another day, another way, a new life that they can choose in the light and joy of the resurrection. And couldn't our world use a little bit more of that light and joy. So my fellow witnesses, receive and hear this grace and this peace of the resurrected Jesus, and then go and do likewise. Go and make peace. Go and offer grace. Go witness to the love that you own and be the resurrected Christ to a world hurting and fear and afraid. Amen.